Welcome, everyone, and, and thank you. We're very grateful to you for joining us here tonight and for being part of our community. My name is Elric Walker, and I'm a board member um, of the Young Association. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Young Association of Western Massachusetts. We are a mostly volunteer organization. We were founded in 1996, concerned with promoting and exploring in community with others, the ideas of the great depth psychologist, Carl Gustav Jung. I would like to take a quick moment to introduce you to our board members, some of whom are here tonight, others are off adventuring. Um, and I want to thank them all for uh, all their work on behalf of the association. Christine Olson is our president. Christine is currently adventuring in Greece. Erica Lorenz, uh, our past president, uh, who has stayed on as, as advisor. Erica is tonight on her way to some adventures in Cairo, Egypt. Judy Hall, our bookkeeper, is in Santa Fe. <laughs> uh, Judith Breyer is here tonight, and she's helping with fundraising and hybrid tech. Uh, Dan Hathaway uh, is our, our newest board member, and Penelope Tarasuk um, is an advisor to the board, and of course, she's our speaker tonight. I am uh, our public relations liaison. Many kind thanks to Andy, who is here tonight providing Zoom and technical assistance. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I just wanna mention upcoming lectures. We have a lecture coming up on Friday, December the 1st, um, seven o'clock. The title of this uh, lecture will be Synchronicity and Death, Liminal Experiences at the Time of Transition. And that is with Robert Hopke. I also wanna mention looking a little further ahead that our January lecture will bring Natalia Pavlikova from Moscow, Russia. She'll be accompanied here by our own Ed Tick with a lecture that will be titled Exploring the Russian Psyche, Light and Shadow. Now, because the time difference between here and Moscow, uh, the lecture will not be on the first Friday of January, which is our usual time of first Friday, but instead it will be on Saturday, January 13th at 11 a.m. So it'll be in the morning. Check the website um, for that and uh, we'll hope to see you at both of those lectures. Um, and do check our website, uh, westmassyoung.org. If you're interested in finding lectures that have already happened, you will find uh, in our ar archives, many of those lectures and other programs that we've presented. Now, tonight's lecture, uh, Penelope Tarasuk is a Jungian analyst. She has served on the boards of the C.G. Jung Institute of New England, the training program, and our, our association. She teaches, supervises, consults with those integrating non-ordinary experiences. She practices Tibetan Buddhism. She wanders in nature and is a lifelong artist. Her book, Polishing the Bones, is the story of a Jungian analysis that included assisting in the patient's death. She was a consultant and volunteer at the Santa Fe Animal Shelter and Humane Society for six years. She is certified in Groff holotropic breathwork and most recently certified in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and research with the California Institute of Integral Studies. Penelope has a private practice in South Deerfield, Massachusetts. She is a longtime member of the Jung Association of Western Massachusetts and continues to bring her wisdom and experience to us for which we are deeply grateful. Tonight's lecture promises to be another wonderful exploration of the mysteries of the psyche. I am honored to introduce to you Penelope Tarasuk with her uh, her lecture tonight entitled, We Are Dreaming Animals. Okay, thank you, Elric, and thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Judith. Um, I think I'd like to first take a minute 
uh, maybe three minutes um, of silence to remember the suffering in the world that's going on, the uh, the Middle East in particular, but in Maine and in many, many other places. So if we could just take a moment of silence and go inside and explore that however you wish. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, dreaming animals and that we are an animal that dreams. And we are an animal dreaming animals many times. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then I'm going to um, ask you to participate in a way. So I would I'm going to ask you now while we're getting ready to get a piece of paper and a pen and have that ready. Uh, we'll do um, a very short writing exercise. Um, and depending on how much time I use, I'd like to invite maybe a couple of people to share what they write if um, they feel like it. So please grab a piece of paper and a pen to have that ready. We're not going to do it right now, but um, I'd like to have you participate in this as well. Um, first off, I'd like to honor the land I am on, that we are on here in the Connecticut River Valley, and the indigenous people and the many, many creatures who have lived here and their spirits are still here and that live on. It is a very beautiful place here. And I wanted you to know, I've been here for about 18 years. And when I moved, when I wanted to move here, I had been living in Santa Fe for 11 years. And I came, um, <laughs> I bought this house on the internet, if you can believe it. It was one of the, early, I was an early adapter. But I was looking around uh, in the valley, and um, I came through Sunderland, for those of, this is a local comment, came through Sunderland up over the Blue Bridge, over the, I believe it's the Connecticut River, and I was literally in awe when I saw Sugarloaf Mountain. And I never have quite understood it, but I have recently learned that that is where the tribes would meet and they would drive the caribou herds up the mountain and many tribes would meet and that was a social time and it was a time of culling the caribou. So the great caribou herds actually came through this area. And so not only was I moved in awe by the mountain, and I couldn't understand why it was so powerful. But I, deer are one of my sacred animals, so I ended up here in Deerfield. <laughs> and um, I didn't learn about the caribou herds for quite a while, but the indigenous, many indigenous peoples came to this area to. Um, to meet, to mix, to, you know, to find food. And um, their spirits are still here with us. So I want to honor that. And I want to honor Andrew's work with the indigenous people of this area. So thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I also want to honor all the ancestral spirits of this area, the two-legged, the legless, the finned and the feathered. I want to honor this land. I want to honor the spirits of the east, the rising sun, the spirits of the south, the earth, the spirits of the west, the setting sun, and the movement inward, water. Earth, water, fire, and the spirits of the north, the air. 
So I want to honor those four directions and the four elements, very important to all of us animals. Um, I want to um, invite you to an evening of thinking about reflecting with me. I hate the word lecture because that's not the way I see it. I mean, I present some of the work and reflections and art that I've made and thought over the years. I've been a Jungian analyst. I started my training in Jung's work officially in 1975. And when I was a young child, my father, as I've talked about before, went through a night sea journey or a psychotic experience after his World War II deep sea diving and diving at Pearl Harbor. And when he went through that psychosis, the Navy kept it, wanted to keep him at home and sent a psychologist who happened to have been a Unitarian minister and a Jungian. How's that for <laughs> fate, <laughs> fate or whatever? Anyway, um, that wonderful man, Dr. Tice, had my father eventually writing poetry and essays and fairy tales and painting mandalas, and he carved Moby Dick. And I still have the little boat from Moby Dick. Um, so I was four to eight years old while that happened. So I literally experienced his descent and his return, his night sea journey and his return. So that's really where I started my Jungian studies. But the official ones began in 1975. I was one of the first four students uh, in Boston and one of the first two Jungians in the Boston area. And I'm happy to see Angie's here. Angie's an advanced candidate. And she did that beautiful, beautiful presentation on the seal wife. Maybe she'll come back and teach again. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Um, Anyway, I've been doing analytic work for, you know, really decades and working with dreams and um, seeing the impact of animals on people's lives and their psyches. Um, when I was in Santa Fe, when I lived in Santa Fe for 10 years, I was part of the Jung um, Society there, but I also became involved with the Santa Fe Animal Shelter and did volunteer work. And part of what I did was um, work with the staff around the trauma that they suffered. Um, I learned the shadow side of um, the pet industry, so to speak. And I learned the horrors that can occur with animal ownership and um, saw things that I never thought I would see. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that I've also seen the bright part of people having companion animals and how a number of those animals have helped people through their lives, through their trauma and through their death. And I deeply, deeply honor all of the animals that have been in my life from dogs and cats and horses and chickens and uh, mainly, mainly those, but um, I've really had a lot of relationship with dolphins and the wild creatures here. Um, but I'm ever so grateful for them. So tonight, I'd like to um, ask you to think about this as more of a reflection, a meditation and a reflection. And um, I'm going to be using art and photographs throughout the evening and technology, and I've come to appreciate the hermetic capacity of the technologists, from those who code to those who administer to all of us who are on Zoom. I 
think it's a modern day hermetic art. And I deeply appreciate those technologists who have helped us so that we can be doing this together. Um, I think part of the reason I use art so much in my work is because it's below words. It's, um, it's in a realm of the psyche that's much more related to the right hemisphere of the brain. Uh, it is nonlinear, and it's often based in relationship at the core. So uh, art is very much appreciative. I mean, I'm very much appreciative of that. Um, so after I talk some about the animal realm, I'm going to do a little writing exercise, and then I'm going to talk about um, a work I did with a patient for oh, almost eight years, very, very creative woman who was not only a creative artist and photographer, uh, but was a creative dreamer in a very amazing way. And I ended up helping her die. And she gave me 20 volumes of dreams. And I picked a few to talk about tonight. But I wanted you to have a sense of when somebody really fully commits to doing depth work. Um, and I think that the way she ended up dying had everything to do with all her preparation and creativity. So I, I encourage you to realize you too can bring your depth and creativity to any major life process. So, Andrew. I think we're ready to share screen. Should I go there? Okay. Is this it? Are we going? Are we going now? It's perfect. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's see if I can figure out how to. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will talk about this particular painting later, but that is a sleeping animal brought into an analysis. So tonight we're going to be following the deer throughout the presentation. And I want to remind you that between 10 and 30,000 years ago in the Paleolithic area, we see evidence of cave paintings with deer in them. And we're going to see them in the dreams, not so much the dreams, but in the vision of a dying woman as well. The deer represents a creature of the earth that is swift, nearly silent, bird-like in movements a flight. The deer is the one who appears and disappears, much like the description of a spiritual experience for many people, appearing and disappearing. Eastern practices of kundalini yoga, which I'm not really going to describe, but in that utilizes the breath and internal focused energy to reach experience of higher states of consciousness. Each of the seven energy centers or chakras is in the body is imagined with animal images or symbols. The deer is pictured as the dwelling in the heart chakra, the anatara, the fifth chakra. The heart is the place where the experience of earthly light, life and spirit meet. The heart is the place where the experience of earthly life and spirit meet. And that has an image of the deer in that chakra. The intersection of the spirit and the body is the place of real transformation, the place of the cross. It is the place of suffering and the place of love. The divine appears and disappears like a dream, much like 
the deer appears and disappears. I'm going to read you a Mary Oliver poem. Mary Oliver, our wonderful poet who spent so much time um, in Provincetown in the dunes. And this is from New and Selected Poems, The Faces of Deer. When for too long, I don't go deep enough into the woods to see them, they begin to enter my dreams. Yes, there they are in the pine woods of my inner life. I want to live a life of, full of modesty and praise. Each hoof of the animal makes the sign of a heart as it touches then lifts away from the ground. Unless you believe that heaven is very near, how will you find it? Their eyes are pools in which one would be content on any summer afternoon to swim away through the door of the world. Then love and blessing, then heaven. And there's those hoof prints in the snow looking like hearts, and that's in the Quabbin Reservoir, which is near us here. Carl Jung said, dreams are impartial, spontaneous products of the unconscious psyche outside the control of the will. They are pure nature. They show us unvarnished natural life and are therefore fitted as nothing else is to bring us back to an attitude that accords to our basic human nature when consciousness has strayed too far from its foundations. In a way, he's also saying when we've strayed too much into the realm of the ego, dreams can help bring us back to the organic psyche. Now, I'd like you to just for a moment, close your eyes and remember from being a child, some of the very first animal experiences you had. Your family may have had what they called pets in those days, or maybe you watched ants, or maybe you saw birds or squirrels. Or maybe you lived on a farm, so you knew many animals. But take just take a moment and remember some of your early experiences with actual animals. I want to remind you that the body is nature and it is the early foundation of consciousness, of psyche. We need this body. It supports the psyche. We are animals. We are mammals. We are dreaming animals. We are animals dreaming animals visiting our kin and being in the web of relationship that is reality. Our ancestors dreamed the world, lived in a dream time. Aboriginal humans lived closer to what we would call a waking dream. This is uh, cave paintings in Lascaux, France. I haven't been able to see even the outside exhibits there, but I believe somebody on this call has. And at least 10,000 years ago, these Paleolithic cousins of ours, and I want to remind you, these, the beings, the people who were in the caves making these images are our relations. This uh, and, and those are relations of our current deer now and looks like some sort of horse figure too. This really moves me because whoever went in those caves probably took some sort of torch kind of apparatus and some kind of dust or chalk or stick charcoal and made these pictures the animals weren't in there with them. 
but they carried this in their mind, which if you think about it, it is an enormously sophisticated process of having seen something in the outside world, taken it into the psyche and gone into the caves and put it on the wall. And in a way, he, she, they gave birth to images. And this is what we call art. And these are Aboriginal dancers in um, Australia. These are Aboriginal dancers in Australia, and they're dressed like animals. And these are particularly deer type creature creatures. And not only do they assume the position, but they imagine into the creature and move like the creature and enter an altered or non-ordinary state of communion with a particular creature here, deer, perhaps readying for the hump, the hunt, excuse me. Uh, and they relied on animals for food and survival. Erica sent me this, um, a, a podcast quote, which is that 98% of human history and 99.9% .9 of our ancestors who've lived, breathed, and inter interacted with a world that they saw and felt to be animate, imbued with life force, inhabited by and permeated with forces, which in with which we exist in an ongoing relation, this animate vision was the water in which we swam. It was consciousness in its natural dwelling place, the normative way of seeing the world and our place in it. It wasn't a theory, a philosophy, or an idea. It wasn't actually is an ism. It, it was a felt experience. It was simply how things were which is why it's been commonly understood across the entire world for all time. And as I contemplated the meaning of animism, which is the attribution of soul to plants and natural phenomenon, um, the belief in a supernatural power that organizes and animates the material universe, I thought a lot about it. I was thinking about that's kind of a description of psyche, but also that I think that's been more true and more recently we have moved into uh, less of animism and more into virtual realities. And I'm wondering how that's really gonna affect everything. Um, I think up until <laughs> practically the cell phone, but I feel like so many people are looking at screens and we're doing it right now. And how many people used to look at animals or spend more time with their animals or in nature. And there's so many more people looking at screens. This is a picture of the deer dance in Santa Fe, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is a Santa Alfonso de Delfonso Pueblo, one of the 13 northern Pueblos. And most of those Pueblos have been continuously lived in for over 900 years. And think about all the times you've moved. And in these Pueblos, there's been continuous, the Talos Pueblo, continuous over 900 years family and family's relations have lived in the Pueblo and they might maintain a house outside the Pueblo as well. But speaking of being grounded, <clears throat> and um, many of the dances have um, a theme of an animal or a season, the corn dance. This happens to be the deer dance and it's performed um, it's a theme and it's related to nature and cycles in nature. And each, each dance is a story of renewal. So they costume and there's singing and there's drumming and there's, um, it's a communal ritual for the whole community. And it's an expression of gratitude and communion with the earth and divinities. 
and I've attended and there'd be like people from age three to ancient people, big men in costumes, and the whole community would rotate around a plaza area, singing, dancing, drumming, and entering non-ordinary states of consciousness. And after the dance, and there would be many people would bring food to a kind of communal area, and afterwards they would open their homes to the community and feed whoever was there. So you could attend and eat with them. But these still go on at different seasons of the year, certainly in New Mexico. I'm not sure where everybody's doing this, but this is the deer dance. And it is a very moving, moving thing to be present at these rituals. And I'd like to say that the deer is venerated around the world. Um, I'm thinking of Huichol art in South America. I'm thinking about uh, in Tibet, the deer is in the artwork. The deer in the form of the cousin yak helps the people survive. But the deer and the cousin is the buffalo has been so sacred to so many peoples around the world. So what about dreaming animals. We often forget that we are part of a family, that we're cousins to animals. And we're if we if we don't remember that, if we don't realize that we're kin, it has enormously negative consequences. And the I think the deepest one is that we lost we lose the sense of kinship the loss of relationship with the animals. When we don't recognize the other as kin, whether it's in the animal realm or other cultures, we're more likely to degrade, enslave, dominate, ignore, and destroy the other. Certainly, we're likely, we're likely to fail to recognize their lives as having inherent value aside from our own narcissistic use of them, whether it's animals or other people and cultures. Henry Besson talks about animals as other nations. Animals comfort us, companion us, feed us, warm us, clothe us, work for us, participate in war for us, submit to our research in medicine, and they bring us joy and awe. Do we not owe them enormous reverence and gratitude? And we notice that animals too dream. And who among you hasn't seen your own dog running and barking and yipping in sleep? And sometimes cats. Um, I can't speak about all animals, but I know dogs and cats, and I know that dolphins do not sleep as we do, but they rest parts of their brain because they are, like whales, the only conscious breathers on the planet. If they don't consciously take breaths, they will die. So you cannot anesthetize dolphins and whales. They would die. So they rest parts of their brain. So perhaps they're in a kind of semi-dreaming without a full sleep like we know. Indigenous societies valued dreams for their contribution to the well-being of the group, the tribe. Now in modern time, dreaming is largely devalued, ignored, or even mocked. Subcultures such as ours are the exception. The dominant culture in a dominant culture that prizes extroversion, aggression, and materiality, the subtle gift of dreams is often overlooked and bypassed. I would like to consider us an underground railroad of introverts and the keepers of stories and the knower of dreams and dreaming as an ancient way in which the world is created and recreated especially in dark, chaotic times like now. 
And remember, Jung says that dreams are outside the control of the will and the ego. They seem to come from a realm of great mystery. So why do we dream animals? Animals are the body, instinct, and the embodiment of spirit. Usually in dreams, they're alive, but not always. They remind us of our senses, our instincts, our passions, our uncivilized selves. To some of us, civilization as it exists now does not look so attractive. Animals are pure nature, amoral in a sense, yet living in a balance with nature, especially if undisturbed by us, by human encroachment. Animals in dreams are, in dreams, animals carry our projections, what's denied or disowned or shadow material, shadow material in ourselves and in our personality and of the greater self. Animals may receive our projections, parts of experience, part, parts of an experience of ourselves that is rejected by the ego and seen as shameful and socially unacceptable. But this might also include what we would call the bright shadow. The repressed or denied positive aspects of ourselves can sometimes be projected on animals. This is a dream. Um, this is from a dream of a sleeping bull or cow. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but this was a dream I had when I was in the beginning part of my Jungian analysis. And it actually has the three colors of alchemy, the, uh, the black of negredo, you might say depression, the white of the whitening or the albedo, and the red, the rubedo, which is kind of the culmination of life. But all three of those colors are in this. And I, I share it with you because um, it's, if we, I, again, I'm not sure if it's a cow or a bull, but it illustrates strength and fertility, for virility, earthiness and fertility. And I was a young woman, so this was sleeping. This energy was sleeping in my psyche, in the unconscious, and um, was available, but I hadn't awakened most of that energy. So it could have been about sexual energy or brutishness or clumsiness or fertility or strength, but it was um, Taurus, earth energy. And so... When somebody brings a dream like this, it's like you reflect on it, but okay, so if you wake that energy up, what's going to happen in that person's life? You know, that they have to be prepared to allow that animal energy into life. And later, I was thinking about this as the sacred cow as well, so that the cosmic cow is sleeping in my unconscious when I'm 30. That's a long time ago. Dreaming animals connects us with ourselves, our personal history and memory, but also our ancient instinctual capacities. Our complex hurts are rooted in basic experiences of attachment and loss and embodied relationship. Dreaming of one's early experience of animals, actual animals, stuffed toy animals, imagined animals are all pathways to, to memories. And sharing those memories and association in a relationship, such as with a therapist or an analyst or a dear friend who's also growing. Um, in other words, sharing those dreams and what they lead to in memory, in, 
in remembering early experiences of animals often will take us back to some very deep experiences of uh, attachment and loss. So you, you probably need to be careful who you share those dreams with, but we all need to share those. And we get to know some of our deeper capacities, our deeper wounds through our work with dreams, but particularly animal dreams. And these dreams can help us heal, not undo, but heal traumatic wounds and grow through them. Um, when we dream of wild animals, it can connect us to a greater web of life and opening us to raw instincts. And also those wilder dreams can help us touch the wilder experiences of birth, illness, and dying as well. Dreaming animals can be an experience of being taught or led of guidance and support. Sometimes it's fearsome, sometimes joyous and delightful, but it can, but animal dreams can act as a kind of guide or psychopomp. And a psychopomp is an ancient term for guide of the soul as we approach the archetypal field of birth or death animal teachers and ancestors can be there supporting us. Um, when I applied to my Jungian training, I had a dream the night before um, my interview. And I, and of course they asked me about the dream, you know, did you have any dreams last night? <laughs> How classic is that? And I had a dream, actually I had several dreams, but I chose only to share one. And the dream was I was given an ancient tile of a dolphin. And it was like a postcard from antiquity. It was a gift straight from Greece, um, which I later found in the Palace of Knossos, the image of the dolphins in the Palace of Knossos. Anyway, that was the dream I had before my Jungian interviews. And I remember we talked about the dolphin as um, a metaphor for the womb. And um, it's very impressive. I, the dream I didn't share had to do with flying all around the earth and visiting all kinds of cultures and whatnot. And I thought, I probably shouldn't share that dream because <laughs> I thought they would think I was too ungrounded or who knows what, but it was a, it was. It's a good choice, probably. Anyway, so, um, okay, let's see, where are we? Okay, now, about five years into my analysis, maybe a little later, here's the little dream up in the corner. I was just trying to, you know, give a symbol of receiving that dream as like a postcard from antiquity. Um, but this dream happened, I was in training for at least five years, and uh, I was in an airplane, and the plane caught on fire and was crashing, and I fell out of the plane, and my clothes were torn off in the descent, and it was very rapid, and I descended into the ocean, and I was met by a dolphin. And I could breathe underwater. And the dolphin took me to an underwater city that I had no idea existed in the unconscious. I share this because I think the plane, the airplane was being up in my head and in my mind and in my thoughts. And I think the descent into the water was really a descent into the unconscious, into my nature, my you know, here I am like being reborn. I'm a naked like a baby. And my relationship is with this, this dolphin as a guide of my soul. So I share that with you because later I found another artist who did something similar. And I wanted to 
share that. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, animals can also be direct experiences of the divine, epiphanies of holy terror, numinosity, beauty, and awe, and sometimes pure delight. Such experiences are unmediated by priests or other outer authorities, and they are human capacity and birthright. Um, this is um, an image called Her Face, and it's by an artist named Meinrad Craighead, who I discovered some years ago. And uh, just a few words about her. She was um, a contemporary artist who resided in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's now deceased. And I loved her work. She has wonderful, wonderful books for anybody. Uh, again, Meinrad Craighead. She, um, let's see, uh, let's see. She lived with her grandparents in Little Rock, Arkansas. In the summer, in the summer, she lived with her grandparents. Um, she was very close to her grandmother, and I believe her grandmother had some sort of um, physical condition, maybe even ovarian cancer or something. But she took laudum, which was a, a form of opium, I suppose, in those days. So her grandmother was pretty close to the unconscious. Anyway, Meinrad um, adored her grandmother, and she herself went to Catholic school and high school and received a BA at a small Catholic college in Iowa, and then an MFA from the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and then moved to Albuquerque and taught art. Then she traveled in Europe and on a Fulbright fellowship, and in 1966 entered the Benedictine monastery, Stanbrook. I think it's in Yorkshire, England. And for 14 years, she was a nun, and the order supported her art. And I suggest you look her up at some point because it's extraordinary. Meinrad express, expressed a very early deep attraction to the Black Madonna. Her artistic expression was supported by the order, and in, in, after 14 years, she left the order and moved to Albuquerque, where she lived for at least 30 more years, doing a great deal of artwork and raising, animal, raising a particular kind of dog she found wonderful, who always was a companion animal for her. This particular piece she did is from a memory of being a seven-year-old child. And this is, is an experience of epiphany with her dog. Quote, it was my seventh summer. I think everything and everyone was sleeping that afternoon in North Little Rock. It was hot. The day, the dust, the sun were red, and the roses were wide open. As you can see, those are hydrangeas. I lay with my dog in a cool place on the north side of my grandparents' clabbered house. Hydrangeas flourished there, shaded from the heat. The domed blue flowers were higher than our heads. I held the dog, stroking her into sleep. But she held my gaze. I watched the dog and she watched me. There was an equal balance of weight. As I looked into her eyes, I knew that I would never travel farther than into this animal's eyes. They were deep, bewildering, and as unattainable as the night sky. Just as mysterious was another movement. Inside me, there was a deep rush of water. I heard a sound in my ears resounding from my breast. I gazed into the dog's eyes and listened to the sound of water inside myself, and I understood this is God. 
And she did many, many pieces with the dog god in her work. So please look her up. But what I part of what I love about this is these are two animals, belly on the earth, belly to the mother earth, eye to eye gazing. And this is a very deep mammalian attachment. She's attached to the dog, to the earth, to the great mother. So this is deep embodiment. Now, I ran across this piece from Jung's vision seminars. And Jung says, you remember that the purpose of the Dionysian mysteries was to bring people back to the animal. Not what we commonly think understand by that word, but but to the animal within. And now Jung's describing one of his patients. She looks directly into the eyes of an animal, and they are full of woe and beauty because they contain the truth of life, an equal sum of pain and pleasure, the capacity for joy and the capacity for suffering. One could say that these are the eyes of the beginning of the creator. When our patient reached out, reached the animal level, one could say she had undergone the essential experience of the Dionysian mysteries, which then forms a bridge between herself and the original primordial man concealed beneath the historical layers of the past. This is such a convincing experience, such an astonishing revelation It is an uncanny and profound experience which contains absolute truth. She has touched the bottom. She has looked into the eyes of the animal and the animal soul has gone into her. She has been united with the animal, with the deepest part of the collective unconscious. And that is an unforgettable experience which will cling to her. And Maria Gumbutas, the old European archaeologist and mythology of the goddess expert, says, at the core of prehistory loom the animal archetypes, symbols of fertility and death that stand beside the great mother in what could only be described as an epiphany. Her animals are neither totems nor the independent divinities of polytheistic beliefs. They are the deity herself, defining her personality and exemplifying her power. Her sacred animals act in the myths as guides and soul carriers, much as they do in fairy tales and dreams. And an epiphany is the manifestation of the divine, revelation or evidence, any manifestation of God or demagogue. And manifest is defined as clear and obvious to the eye or mind. Now, wait a minute. Okay, here's here's another picture by Mon- Menrad about f- uh, four years later. And here she has some angelic figure pushing the dreamer, the sleeper down into the water. And you see, this is a lunar, this is a lunar scene, full moon. And there's the turtle whose reptilian consciousness, the turtle is, um, you know, we think of the turtle as it's turtles all the way down. (laughs) Um, and here's the dreamer's eyes are closed and the turtle's eyes are open and she's comforting this turtle she's clinging to this turtle much like we cling to stuffed animals and she just she's feeling her way into the unconscious but she's getting a nudge from this divinity, a feminine divinity from above. Now, when I was doing the initial research on all of this, I put these two pictures side by side and you see on the left, mine was lunar. There's 
sunshine. I am, my, my eyes are wide open and I don't have an angel. I have a silver bird, which is an airplane. And we both go, I'm going into the sea and she's going into what seems to be a pond. But one of the differences here is the velocity. And I would say that sometimes when we come into consciousness of things or have epiphanies, they're gentle. And sometimes they are dramatic filled with speed and power and, and overcome us. But I really love that this was lunar and this was um, solar. Um, there's all kinds of initiations. They can come in all kinds of different forms. So my experience tells me that the appearance of animals in dreams indicates that one is experiencing life more fully, flesh, blood, body, earthly light, the embodiment of spirit in flesh, and the awakening to companions and receiving help from the animals, acknowledging our personal psychological history, especially attachment and loss, and remembering the creatures we knew as children whether they were wild creatures or domestic creatures, or even, I mean, I mean, even as small as ants and bumblebees and those sort of things. Or even if you get to the zoo and you see these wild creatures and these sea creatures that wake up your imagination. And with Psyche's help, possibly, um, we're help, but sometimes I think that we're also used by Psyche for Psyche's realization. And we don't really think about that very much. We're, we're so egocentric. We think it's all about our growth and our purpose and blah, blah. But I have, as I get older, I'm starting to realize that we're being, we are a vehicle for the self and we get used to do work that the self needs done. So it's a very interesting shift. Um, so now I wanna share with you, um, I had dolphin dreams throughout my Jungian training. Um, and when I got to the end of my training and I was getting ready to defend my thesis, I just threw my papers down. I was meeting with um, uh Edith Solwell, some of you may know her from out here. She's no longer with us, but she was going over it with me. And she, she said, well, what do you really want to do if you don't want to review that? I said, you know, I want to swim with dolphins and lie in the sun. And she looked at me and she said, you have to do that. <laughs> and little did I know. So I graduated in 1988 and I had cleared two weeks to go river rafting with a friend in Santa Fe. And then I got a brochure saying breathwork with dolphins. <laughs> um, a, a woman scientist and an Australian healer were leading groups, breathwork with dolphins. And I thought, wow, I really want to go and be with the dolphins, but I, did, I wasn't interested in breathwork yet. So I went and um, this next picture was from my first encounter in the water with dolphins. And I won't go into the whole experience, but I will tell you that we swam eye to eye and they, they could go back out to sea at any point. And I had this enormously intimate encounter with the dolphin who then took my hand in I don't remember if it was a he or she, her flipper. And I felt the bones in the flipper that were ancient vestiges, vest, it was like vestiges of hands. And in that moment, I felt like I was in some sort of bridge to something extremely ancient. It was as though... It was like it was like that picture of the child with the dog. It was an epiphany of connection from the ancient to the present. 
So I went on and swam with wild dolphins for many years. Haven't been for about six years now. So I may I may not be doing that anymore. But um, I can tell you it was enormously inspiring to be in the water. Number one, to be in the ocean. And number two, to not be eaten by something that big. Um, but as it turned out, the breath work was wonderful. And I began to do visionary artwork and I started drawing the experiences with dolphins, etc. So what I learned is that um, they're incredibly intelligent creatures and very curious about us. And if they want to be with you, they stay with you. If they don't, they're gone in a flash like Quicksilver. So I've been very fortunate. Um, so I want to take a pause right there. Yeah, take a pause. And it's about eight o'clock now. So I'm going to come. If I come out, can I go back in, Andy? Yes. Okay. Well, maybe I won't even come out, but I'm going to invite people now um, to um, let me see the gallery. Won't let me do that. To take five minutes, just five minutes, I'm going to time it. And I had asked people to bring um, paper and a pencil or pen. And I'm going to give you a prompt, and we're going to just have five minutes. And um, I want you to allow yourself to write in some way or another about your experience with animals, whether it be in dreams or in actuality or stuffed animals or currently or whatever. But the prompt is just below the surface. So go ahead. You don't lift your pen up off the paper. You don't put punctuation. You don't capitalize. Just let yourself go. And I'm going to time it for just five minutes. Okay. So just stop wherever you are. And because we have some time, and I'd really like to hear from you, are there any brave souls who are willing to read their piece? If you would put your hand up and Andy, uh, uh, let's see, I guess Andy or Elric, Andrew or Elric, who's going to, um, maybe I should have Andrew um, call on people. Go ahead, Derek. Okay, hi. Um, just below the surface of my memories of these dog friends when I was eight, Morgan and Jazz, these long-haired creatures rolling around and playing in the living room, um, being nipped by this mother-daughter duo their shiny coats of hair, their big teeth, their love, their camaraderie, playing, sniffing, just below the surface, this fur, these beings, these friends, they're running, panting, wagging their whole butts. I miss them just below the surface. What did they want from me, nipping me when I was riding my bike too far from the house? They knew me. I was their kin, but I wasn't around adults who knew how to talk about the poetry of love with animal companions, didn't support me in sitting in those questions together. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Andy, Andrew, anyone else bravely just read their piece? Go ahead, Elric. I 
have to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Just below the surface, the flash of fins and scales, iridescent jeweled eyes, hide and seek among the shafts of sunlight. The moving giant, old, ancient, mysterious wanderer of the deeps. What do you see down there? Who do you meet? Thank you. Thank you. Hey. More? Martha, Marta, I think, yeah, Looks I saw. like there's, yeah, there's Rosalind and Rosalind's partner. There you go. Go ahead, Rosalind and partner. Just below the surface, I find a hole in the bank of the creek. As I reach my hand in, I feel a smooth head with sharp fins on its back. I know not to get caught by the spines. I slowly slip my hand into its mouth and my fingers go into its gills so I can hold it and keep it from going away. It's clearly a large catfish and not a water moccasin. Then I bring it out of its hole and up to the surface and onto the bank, relieved, shaking, proud. Mm. Thank you. Marta? Just below the surface, I remember when I was very young, my sister and I discovered our cat, <laughs> Fluffy, in a dresser drawer. She had given birth to kittens, many kittens, very sweet. I wanted to taste their little ears, and I felt terrible about that treat quite some time after that. Shelly and I, that was my sister, played with glass animals. Very <laughs> fragile toys, but we love them. Uh, later, we I learned about the play, The Glass Menagerie. Of course, we had lots of stuffed animals, but I'm most curious about whatever happened to those glass animals. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. I'll take a turn. <laughs> Just below the surface, I could see the squid move ever so fast and then gone in a cloud of ink. That led to remembering meeting April on Nantucket Island where she was a stray. April was a dog. A cat. A cat. And that led to uh, remembering the song that I wrote to memorialize my relationship with animals that I associate with my mother. And there's a verse that includes April the cat. Aww. On a springtime excursion, we adopted a Persian who purred and took naps in the light. And then our dog left a sweater behind for our lost dog to find and welcomed her home late that night. And the chorus, be a friend to the animals, so many splendid animals, and they'll be a friend to you. The mangled and the maimed ones, the wild and the tamed ones. Yes, they'll be a friend to you. Mm. Thank you, Andrew. That's beautiful. <laughs> wow. And Beth? Beth, go ahead. 
I I'm I'm so moved by everybody's and I love the song <clears throat> that he just sang. How lovely. Um mine is a little different. Um I'm in bed with my two dogs. That's why I don't have my video on. <laughs> um but just below the surface. Just below the surface of this fine, thin skin of a thoroughbred, rippling with vitality, dancing with joy, prancing with energy and stamina, ready to ride, to run in freedom and exuberance with the joy of being, the fresh air of pure existence, relishing, the luminous is dancing. Mm -hmm. On the green moss, cold bracing air, steam rising, then pause and pawing the ground in a silent wood, stillness and alone, the moonlit night of beauty, soundless, a light, gentle snow, a flake here and there. This is where I wanted to be. The wild run was only to find this, the mm. deepest silent beauty in the clear night. I'm home. Mm. Thank you, Beth. Wow. Wow. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead, Carol. I just put my hand and was writing, so it said, animals are everywhere, but I don't see them. I just keep walking. Walking seems difficult. What can I say about animals? The closeness, the beingness, the, the use of my body, the availability for touch. And suddenly the whole thing shifted, by the way, and this is what I wrote. Uh, I dreamt I was a salamander once. <laughs> I was delighted. I moved over the rocks of a cold mountain stream, but I didn't seem to have rigid bones. I was part, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, and I don't know why I would think I was that molten, part muscle. Uh, how did I move? Anyway, it was a delight, and I enjoyed it. The water was freezing, and the task there was somehow to, to overcome your resistance. But I just became the cold water, and I became a salamander. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Carol. <laughs> Go ahead, Jen. Okay, let's see. Just below the surface of all that I believed was reality was a tiny underworld of complete wonder I was instinctively drawn to. I looked for it, but more realistically or actually, it whispered to me with a, with a magnetic pull which caused me to discover it. I thought I discovered it there, but it sought me, pulled me towards it, with an energy I knew would, I would love and be drawn to again and again. This underworld of, of complete wonder was nature herself, eternal as the beginning of, as the beginning and amazing as the universe itself. I remember distinctly a warm summer afternoon as a younger me, much younger in fact, laying on my stomach on our backyard in the grass. This magnetic energy pulled me down at grass height level. There I discovered little insects crawling on to the tops of blades of grass, going about their sacred little lives. Mm -hmm. I watched in amazement and my imagination kicked in and my creativity was activated upon witnessing this magic, magical, intriguing scene. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, thank you. Hmm. Now, Angie, Angie had had her hand up at one point. Is Angie still there? Anybody else? Thank you. 
I did that by accident, but maybe that was meant to happen. <laughs> so I'll, I'll read what I wrote. Um, I have COVID right now, so my head is fuzzy. So this feels very fuzzy. Um, just below the surface, all I see are bubbles, bubbles and light. I'm holding my breath. Then I realize the bubbles are the blown breath of an immense creature who beckons me down in the currents, large as a landscape. I see the black and white fields of color so close I can't see the shape of this creature. What is it? But I feel its being blazing toward me, its joy, its curiosity, its energy, drawing me into a labyrinth of watery, Passages, coral or rock and kelp waving, shadowing and sheltering, many eyes peering out. Mm. Another orca nudges closer to see. These creatures are kin. I hear their bewildering speech, almost deafening, songs and signals, complex and full of history, of deep relationship. I gently run my hand along the black, enormous side with love and thanks. Oh, thank you, Angie. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Anyone else before we move on? Okay. Um, let's see if I can get back to share screen. Okay, here we go. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to take some time and tell you about a woman I worked with for almost eight years. And I wrote a book about the treatment. Um, she gave me permission to write about her life and use her dreams. Her presenting problem for analysis was that of a broken heart, sorrow, multiple losses, and a tremendous amount of unexperienced grief. I would say that we had quite a positive transference, counter-transference over the course of that time, not the entire time, but we were both artists. We were both mothers. We were both sisters. We were both women, of course. And she came with health issues. Uh, when she was about 28, she had breast cancer, um, metastatic breast cancer, actually. And the hospital at that time, this was before blood was screened. So a very famous hospital gave her hepatitis B and C, but that was unknown for a long time. Um, later, um, uh, when that manifest in her life, she came to see me when she was 54, about age 60, 56, excuse me. And about age 64, she, um, she had led a very healthy health related life, ate well, exercised, um, did all kinds of wonderful complimentary work to keep herself well, but nonetheless, the hepatitis C raged and took over and created a hepatic cellular carcinoma around her portal vein, which was inoperable. Um, and at that time, um, when she was diagnosed as terminally ill, she chose not to have any, well, at first it looked like she had a 5% chance of success in surgery. And then the doctors withdrew that. So she chose palliative care at home and hospice. And after that decision was reached, she had had a very, very profound dream about grieving, dying. And we ended the analysis. And about between a week and two weeks later, she and her husband called me and asked me if I would help her die. And I went through quite a process of deciding whether or not I could do that because it meant flying across the country and it meant living with the family every other week for th nearly three months. 
Um, so I consulted with my patients, with my family, with my mentor, and I decided I would do that, although there were no models whatsoever for me to follow. But I, um, I would say the frame of the work changed. We were no longer sitting in an office or working by phone. But when I lived in the house with them, I had my own floor. It was a big old farmhouse in Vermont. And uh, so I had my own space and we had a business contract. And um, so there was still a frame, but it was no longer analysis. And I was much more present as a witness and as a as an intimate other, a spiritual friend. And I didn't know what I was doing and she'd never died in this life before. So we um, companioned one another and I helped her and her family through her dying process. Um, so there was a change in the vessel, but the work was about letting go. And I, uh, I think I was able to help her with that significantly because I knew her so well and it supported her husband and her two adult sons too in the process. Over the course of the nearly eight years, there have probably been a, you know hundreds of dreams. And I chose about, I think about 10 dreams to write about. But she had given me 20 journals, and I um, had them sent home to my house because I was traveling across the country to work with her every other week for three months. I was present when she died, um, and it was it was an initiation for me into the realm of dying in a whole new way. Before I made the decision, I'd had a dream about I was on a picnic with she and her husband. And there was a wonderful, it was a beautiful spring day and there was a stream. I could hear it. It was like paradise. We were having a picnic and I woke to that dream and I thought, what, what kind of dream is that? This is about death and dying. And then I realized that I had some preconceptions about how it all would be. So the writing of the book took about 10 years, and it was my form of grieving her, her life. But it was this delving into the creative that I would have never gone into had it not been for the, the strength of the analysis and the profundity of, of this work. So anyway... I published that in 2017, and it's called Polishing the Bones. So I walk people through the analysis as though you're kind of just with me going through it. So I'm really going to condense this, but I picked out um, a few dreams to share with you to give you a sense of how the animals were important. So... In a Jungian analysis, the psyche speaks and reveals to the analyst hints and information that the analyzan may not even know consciously. And every analyzan seems to have a personal language and an array of landscapes and characters and even animals. Animals, domesticated, wild, imaginal, or mythic, may appear, and they come from different strata of the psyche. The dream may tell me what the analyzan's ego cannot. I would say in my work that the psyche leads the way and works with me. In other words, it's not me doing the analysis. It's the psyche leading both the patient and the analyzan, the patient and the analyst. Dreams are extremely important and helpful in the process of individuation the striving toward wholeness and the work of completing a life. And using a series of dreams from this analysis, I wanted to open and illustrate some of the points discussed on the nature of animals and animals and dreams. 
So I'm going to call her Laura, and she and her husband generously gave me full permission to use all her materials after her death. So the first one I'll share is the dog. And she, the initial dream she had was about that she brought was about uncovering a monolith. So there were no animals in the first dream, but the following, this is from after the first session. So this was the first dream that came after we started the analysis. I look down and I am, I see I am naked and I move to the foot of the bed where I can see into another room. There's a dog there very happy, wagging its tail and looking at what seems to be an opening in the wall, which turns out to be a painting, a semi-abstract painting propped up against the far corner of the room. There's a glass covering the painting in which I begin to see my reflection. The dog continues to wag its tail. He's very happy. He has an erection. Gradually, the two images of the dog and myself begin to merge, and I wake, thinking of the symbolism of this merger, feeling tremendously empowered, particularly about painting, but also about proceeding with my life without deliberate reliance on the men in my life. So my comments were that Alara had immediately began to respond to the analytic support and reflection with vulnerability. It's very rare for people to bring a picture, bring a dream of being naked in the second session. <laughs> it's, just, it's just really, really rare. So she brought a dream of her nakedness and her curiosity and then her instinctual being presented as a dog, a domesticated companion animal, not a wild or mythic creature. So I know from this dream that she's, that there's something very kind of earthy and predictable about this, this animal, as opposed to if she brought snakes and lions and, you know, that sort of thing which would be a, a, a very different experience. But this was a kind of a domestic experience, a familiar, a dog, a companion animal. A, this was the family dog, a family dog like theirs. Um, her instinctual being is presented here as a dog, a companion animal. It's happy, alive, fertile in an assertive phallic masculine sense, and it's leading her to her creative life. In the dream, the merging of ego, instinct, art, and reflection is an enormously sophisticated piece of psychological work by the second session. Now, mind you, she'd had therapy for a few years before, but this is such a sophisticated dream And I see that her psyche can respond very quickly to treatment with wonderful, even humorous complexity. The dream has a lively, hopeful feeling for the analyst and the patient in analysis. So that's just to give you a sense of, um, you know, that this is a pretty extraordinary person who's so willing to immediately move into this. And um, this, she's an artist, and she has spent, like many women of that age, I guess she was born in the 30s, the 1930s, and uh, women were still sort of, many women were not really independent. Many women were still just, just finding their footing. But for her, um, this dog seemed to help bring her back into relationship with her own sense of art. And she did start doing art again. Now this dream, the Eagle, she didn't bring this till she was in the analysis about a year, but in fact, she'd had the dream before she even decided to come into analysis. And, 
And what's interesting is not only did she have the dream before she came into analysis, but she didn't bring it till a year later. And then it showed up right before her death. So it's a, it's a very significant dream in her psyche. And this was called the Eagle. And it's about a year into the analysis that she shares it with me. I'm in a field facing West in the West. The land is flat and I can see for miles except for places behind brush, stage, sagebrush, tumbleweed and mesquite. There are small groups of people scattered here and there. And suddenly I see an eagle with its wings out spread completely, falling straight to the earth, surely to its death. There's blood on it, lots of it. It strikes the ground head first as it holds its wings rigidly away from its body. Everyone gasps both at the beauty of the creature, its size and perfection, and the sight of its impending doom. But as soon as the bird hits the ground, it soars back up into the sky again, high up, rapidly. And we all see a smaller bird, a hawk or a falcon, is following it from the exact spot where the eagle struck. The smaller bird is also bloodied, and the two do a ballet like this, repeating the rising and falling, following one another in turns. This is repeated two or three times, and each time the birds fall to earth, they are behind some vegetation and cannot be seen. The final time we see the eagle rise into the sky, and it is no longer followed by the falcon. There's a feeling of utter triumph of freedom, and I realize I'm the eagle. Now, when she brought me this dream, a year into treatment, she read it and it was flat. It was just, it was a really good story, but she wasn't in it. And I raised this because a, a couple of weeks before she actually died, um, I was working with her and her very dear friend was working with her. Her friend was an artist and had been very involved with her life and was a very dear friend for many years and had done teaching with her. But anyway, he and I were working with her and we stayed very close to her during this dying time. And um, she decided two weeks before her death to collaborate on a project where this was her dream and, and, Brian was a an etching artist, and he was going to make an etching, and I would write up something about this dream. So it was this three-way collaboration that formed just about two weeks before she died. So this is what I wrote about the dream. The setting of the dream is in a field facing west an open, undefined, natural place. And facing west would be symbolically in traditional terms being facing introversion, incubation, hibernation, or death. The west is a place in the American psyche that describes the pioneering spirit, the sense of open spaces and potential life. Externally in her life and family history, the West drew her maternal grandmother, who was an artist, and later Lara herself went to California and lived and began to, to be a designer. More immediately and personally, at the time she had the dream, she was in the southwestern desert with her husband while he was working, I think it was Las Vegas, he was in a creative project and he was totally immersed in it and not paying any attention to her. She went horseback riding in the desert, and the dream came after that. And it was a time of anguish and deep reflection and a preparation for change in her life. In the dream, the habitat is of native plants, representing living beings that can survive, even thrive, without much water. Symbolically for us, this would be the desert representing a time of little external feeling, and going to the desert, going into the desert, traditionally and mythologically, is a time of endurance, contemplation, psychological introversion, 
and confrontation with one's demons and contemplations and temptations, excuse me. The small groups of people are like anonymous and non-interfering witnessing presences or parts of her ego. The initial glimpsing of the eagle is shocking. Its appearance is sudden, like glimpsing the divine is like that. Shocking, dramatic, and often violent. It is engaged in an act that seems utterly connected to death. It's a ter- it's terribly wounded and falling without obstruction. How could anything survive that? And I noticed that red in the form of blood appears in this dream. And red and blood are supreme alchemical colors of passion and the culmination of life itself, the rubedo in alchemy. And I store this information along with the appearance of the regal spirit bird and instinct associated with Christ, the heavenly realms, and the symbol of the United States. The eagle is also a raptor, powerfully aggressive and predatory. Initially, when I heard the dream, I wondered why the spiritual instinct was wounded and why the spiritual instinct was colliding with the earth principle. There are two spiritual instincts in relationship here, the falcon or hawk, which is a known, which is known as a communicator, and the eagle symbolically associated with divine majesty and the consecration of power. The hawk is also Horus, the rising sun, the enlightener in Egyptian mythology. These instincts are in conflict, in a dance, or simply they're in enormous tension. And the two birds in two or three ballet repetitions represent something coming to consciousness in Lara. Seen and unseen, a dream denotes the psychic mystery at work. Perhaps it's an image of the drama of the interrelationship of life and death. But remember, I only heard this dream an, uh, an hour an hour, a year into the analysis. But it is an epiphany that's happening within Lara. But what we don't realize, it is it foretold her dramatic dying. Um, so she, she conceived this product, project, and this was a three by four foot etching done by her dear friend and artist, Brian. And this is a depiction of the descent and ascent of the eagle and the struggle in the middle. Beautiful. Brian made this. He gave me a copy of it. It's so powerful. It's hard to know what to do with it because it sort of is so powerful and dramatic. And now um, I'm not going to tell you this whole piece, but this is about, well, I'll I'll read it to you because it is profound. Um, I just want to go back for a second. Um, The third time that this dream came forward was about two weeks before she died, before she came up with this project. She asked if she could read this dream to a group of us who were sitting around her bed, this is about two weeks before she died. And this time she didn't just read the dream, she became the dream. And I remember her raising her arms and she came into this beautific place and was really owning her own eagle spirit. And it was really beautiful. It was really, um, she had finally owned this ascendant flight that was impending. So that was very beautiful. She would, she didn't do any more dream work once I started working with her and staying there, but she would ask me to read various dreams and invite the people that were in the dreams to come and hear themselves in her dreams. It was a a very creative time. 
but she didn't work on any new dreams. So I'll share this next one just briefly so you get a glimpse of this sort of thing. If it, she just had this extraordinary capacity. There's a large field that I had been caring for. It's flat and golden with new crop of whatever has been planted. I go back and forth between my gardening farming chores to a small structure where I take meals with others. My dear friend Elle is there. She knows my interest in turtles and I tell her I've seen a small one. As I'm leaving the communal eating place, mind you, they both went to a um, residential school in Vermont as children uh, from, I think, five to third, five, and then she graduated there. So this, she, her whole education was at this um, wonderful residential school in Vermont. Um, I tell her, I, as I'm leaving the communal space in the evening and heading toward the field where I sleep, I see an enormous turtle gliding over a ditch up an embankment coming toward me. Elle says the turtle's looking for me, wants to see me, and had come to see me. I'm so happy to have another visitation. And the next time I see the turtle. He's coming toward me in the field from another direction, moving again without the characteristic lumbering slide. It really does look like it's gliding or floating in the air. The turtle comes right up to me, much the way a dog might, and was glad to see me. And I'm on the ground as if ready to go to sleep for the night in the, in the field camping out but there's still daylight. The turtle lands right beside me and half on me, really cuddling as best a turtle can, with front legs around my shoulders and with his head tucked in the curve of my neck. It's absolutely extraordinary. And we're both so comfortable together like that. I can hardly believe the turtle, turtle has chosen to do this. And I call out to my friend L to get the camera and record this event. Don't worry, she said, this is real. But every so often I pull my head back to get a good look at this marvelous creature. And I'm going to um, skip that part. But what happened is the dream was so powerful, she decided to um, learn etching. And her friend Brian taught her etching. So she began to do, and she did a series of these. And if you look in here, you see the heart and the symbol of money and other things in there. But it was as though the turtle dream was so important to her. She, she, she really, this is what I call integration. When people start doing artwork and then she not only learned to etch, but she learned to typeset and she wrote this poem and, um, Elric, can you see this? Can you read it? Starts on the left and it goes to the right. I don't know. Maybe Elric didn't hear me. I, I got you. Yep. In the darkness and cold of a long, moonless night, there comes a visitor descending slowly, legs outstretched, wavering upon the wintry air like a flat pebble dropped upon the water, slicing from side to side, arriving gently, belly to belly, with her host. Turtle comes with 13 shingles on her oval roof. Each one bears two symbols etched in green. Through these, she sends her message from the universe Lie still in times of pain. Breathe deeply. Do not run away. Let each letter come to you in dreams from the night. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, when I talk about this dream in the book, I talk about the golden fields as the wheat fields of the great mother and possibly 
the um, making of the communion host from the wheat. Anyway, it's a, I go into it much more. But, but what I want to concentrate on here is that the, um, that the turtle, it, it's an animal experience. Um, and the turtle universally represents the earth. And we're all held on the earth's back, on the turtle's back. And the turtle has a phallic head and neck and a round feminine body, making it the carrier of the opposites of masculine and feminine. And it has the capacity to withdraw into total introversion. It represents, the turtle represents, the slow and steady pace of evolution that carries all history in its shell, its entire life story. This mysterious creature is seeking Lara. And she exhibits no fear and embraces the experience fully. And, I, and I'm and i emphasizing this because she that's the way she faced her death, with no fear, although she did get anxious. But basically, she really approached her death very openly. And she embraced every experience along the way. Um. And she wants to, she can hardly, it's her dreams and this wish, which came in a few dreams to photograph something. And it was as though she needed to, she wanted to bring it back and share it with other people. She wanted other people to see what she saw. And that's part of why I think she gave me her dreams so that other people could, could experience this. Um, Animal experiences like this have an aboriginal shamanic quality, very old, wise, and directly out of the depths of mystery. The dream energized her creativity, and she created many things, including putting all this in a book, a handmade book. She made 10 copies. Beautiful. Um, and... Um, There's a few more dreams I could go into, but I think I'll I'll basically say she had a dream about six months before she died, and she never talked about it with me. And after I got home, after her dying in cremation, um, I found in her last journal the last dream, and I'll read that to you. And I'm reading this because this was somebody who was raised in a Christian denomination, more around Jesus as a child, but left the church, was not involved with the church her whole life, but practiced, you know, compassion and wisdom and generosity. But she was really a woman of the earth and of nature and animals. So this is the dream she had. That, that informed her, but I didn't even know about this dream until six months, you know, much later after her death. But it was for her. I come to a place where messages and mail have collected. As I glance at the postcards, quote, we have stopped by several times to see you, but you have not been there, unquote. Who is this? An unknown man now comes by, and he's obviously pushing something. He comes to me, and I know I don't want to spend time with him. As he speaks, he pushes a one-inch oval-framed image of Christ into my hand and asks me if I will accept it. I say, of course. The man looks relieved and moves on. Later, I'm sitting on my cot with my lap piled with mail. And the little Christ souvenir slips down off my lap. And I gather my mail together and lay it with some treasured finds. Now, she was a naturalist, so she would go out into the woods. And if she found dead birds or dead rodents or whatever, she'd bring them home and put them in the freezer and then take them out and draw them. So those are her treasured finds. So the little Christ souvenir slips down off of her lap 
together with these dead creatures, birds and bats and rodents and that sort of thing. As soon as I lay down the mail, so they're all together. Um, let's see. The dead bodies of some of the, oh, okay. As soon as I lay down the mail, they, the creatures, come to life. It's as if they just awaken from deep sleep. I'm quite surprised for a brief moment, and I wonder if it has anything to do with my accepting Christ token. I think this is silly, but I can't be sure. I'm drawn to the animals and feel they teach me everything they need to, everything I need to know. And I feel like um, that dream was part of her wrestling with her childlike experience of Christ. And she couldn't quite deny her thoughts around Christ and Christianity, but that really her depth of experience was with nature and animals. And that combination of the resurrection of the animals with the little Christ symbol was just the way her psyche was helping lead her into a deeper understanding. The animal and the animal nature teach me everything I need to know. So I'm going to skip. And this is the last photograph she took. She was a photographer. And this is a picture of a deer moving toward the woods. And um, she died very consciously. And before she died, she had a, a vision of a deer. It's the last morning that Laura walked two days before she died. This was the moment she fell to her knees. This was the moment of her vision of the deer. She had a vision of a deer, and such a vision is often an ancient herald of death the deer showing up, a guide for the departing soul. The vision was swift, quiet, and filled with awesome beauty. In the tiny bathroom with a pine wood Dutch door, just 17 steps from her recently arranged library bedroom on the first floor, in this bathroom chamber, she calculated by the hour her body's withdrawal from the world, measuring cups, with the mind of an alchemist. She did not give up hope. She looked out the window into the woods that were blanketed with snow and she called me and I kneeled near her as she whispered her vision, her epiphany. Oh, Penny, I've seen the deer. It has broken through the snow and ice and it's drinking deeply from the cold waters. And I knew that she'd stopped eating and drinking for days now. So, uh, and within about 24 hours, she died. And it was a, it was a beautiful, graceful um, passing. Um, and I, I go into all of this in much more depth. I, I needed to spend 10 years writing to communicate what I really wanted to, but um, so that's, one person's experience with the animals and vision and dreams. And I just, I honor her and I um, am very grateful. I got to do that work with her and I'm very grateful for all the animals and our dreams. So I added this, just that's a picture of a man dying um, with his dog in hospice. And I just wanted to share that with you. So let's see if I can get back out of here. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, so. Thank you for coming. And um, I'll see you again. Feel free to email me if there's anything you were left with. We didn't get a chance to close, but please feel free to email me. Um, my email is L-I-F-E, numeral four, dream, life for dream at Gmail. Thank you very much for coming. And I wish you 
many animal dreams and may they help you too. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>